All right. Got some folks trickling in. Uh, thank you for joining me. Eight o'clock in the morning on a Saturday to talk about DMX. <laughs> um, I'm gonna put a poll out for those of you who are coming in. Um, please just uh, put answers up as you're as you're coming into the class. And we'll give it a little bit for, for folks to start showing up in earnest. You will hear some background noise. Um, the dog is outside, but there are two cats slowly circling me. So, you know, that shouldn't be a problem. If one of them knocks over the computer, which is it's rigged precariously on like a director's chair and some cardboard boxes. So it could be the death of the class, but we never know. All right. And yeah, we will have um, so this this is a good point also to make right at the beginning of the class. Um, there is, you'll see below you, there's a Q&A field and a, um, a chat. If you've got questions, please, please put them in the Q&A. Um, it's just simpler for me and then other folks can upvote. I'll make sure that is the case. Yep, so you'll be able to upvote other people's questions and uh, kind of rank where things are and that makes it a little bit easier for me to to respond to and make sure that I'm that I'm getting to the because we only have a, a limited amount of time today. All right, so the poll right now is split just beautifully effectively 25% on all four, um, which is I got to you know, it's a little interesting that some very advanced folks are showing up for an intro class, but glad to have you here. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling. Just good to get a sense of the audience. And uh, let's get started. So it looks like there are at least some of you that have no idea what DMX is. Uh, and that's great. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit and then uh, we'll see kind of the, the clip that we're going at in terms of uh, how far I get down the road. There are a lot of other advanced networking classes going on this week. There are, this weekend, uh, Jeremy Moore, Don McLaury are doing a couple of days on console programming, which will tie into this. Uh, ETC is doing a, two days of network training classes as well. So if you sign up for this and you're like, oh my God, this is my favorite thing. This uh, DMX, you've opened up my eyes. Well, we have more content for you available, so. DMX is a lighting control network protocol, which sounds like a lot. Uh, it sounds, you know, like a computer science kind of thing. But I just want to break that down a little bit. So it's a pretty simple idea. It's just a complicated way of talking about it. So it's a protocol. It's a standard. There's a list of criteria to qualify to be a DMX device or a DMX cable. So any device that interacts with the DMX network has to have five pin connectors. You have to have four wires in two pairs in the cable itself. And there's a certain impedance that has to be present on the line. So if you are uh, in a pinch, a microphone cable does not work no matter how, you know, there are three pin XLR fixtures that look like they just take mic cable to control them. That does not work. It will fail. That's the only thing I can say about it. And the, the thing about DMX and the reason that it is something that we're talking about and it's something that, that folks kind of care about right now is that it's not manufacturer specific, which means that if I have, let's say an ETC console and a airy fixture, a Mo Richardson fixture, a strand dimmer, all of those can talk to each other through DMX. We don't have to have proprietary controls for each manufacturer. I don't have to have, well, this is my airy controller for 
Uh, Astera is actually a really good example of something that works outside of that, right? So Astera fixtures, you can control them with DMX and they also have an Astera proprietary control, which is great right up until you need to add an, a sky panel into your effect and then you have to go back out to a DMX level. DMX is, is above, it's non-manufacturer specific, so we can control any kind of multiple fixture rig as long as they're all DMX compliant. Uh, and there's a set of rules for proper operation of DMX, which is basically just, it, it's the way to ensure that your system doesn't fail in strange ways. It's just the limitations of the system. So 32 devices per run of cable. Uh, you cannot, and I'm going to, I'm running through these pretty quickly. Um, we'll be able to circle back and there's a troubleshooting section. Uh, no wise splits. So if you think about um, electricity is a good example, just, you know, power, you can feed in and then split it out and then keep going. With data, with DMX specifically, you have to go in, out, in, out daisy chain only. You cannot suddenly break one line into two. Uh, 1,500 feet maximum run length without repeater. And please God, no rigging pyro, lighting and accessories only. Uh, the reason for this is when DMX fails on a light, the light blinks. When DMX fails on pyro, I mean, yeah, fire. So yeah, there's systems for those. We use different controls that are that are not DMX. And then so DMX lighting control network protocol. So that's protocol. This is network. Uh, all I mean by network, it's this group of things talking to each other. So DMX is one console talking to devices. It's it's easy to, to think about it in that way. So DMX was developed as a theatrical standard because um, I, for those of you who are not familiar, what film does is wait for theater to come up with technology, mostly in terms of lighting, and then we adopt it. So DMX is a theatrical protocol to begin with, and it began as a way for theatrical console operators to control banks and banks and banks and banks of dimmers. So you have one console talking to one dimmer, or, you know, as is more realistic in a theatrical setting, banks of dimmers. And this is, this is where we start getting into some of the language of DMX. So these devices, these dimmers are identified through addresses. You are limited 512 addresses per universe. Universe is a very irritating concept for me in DMX because I get asked, well, what's a universe? A universe is 512 addresses. It's just tautological. It's the limit that one run of DMX can send and it's 512 addresses. You control addresses with channels. Console, control, channel, all of these start with a C. That is the only way I have ever been able to remember. There are addresses at the fixture or the device and the console has channels. They sound like the same thing right now. They're very slightly not. And if you get them backwards, it's frustrating and you will confuse yourself and others. So addresses. Addresses are assigned, uh, assigned numbers between one and 512. And they identify the DMX device. And why would you do this? So the thing about DMX and, and the more that every other technology develops around us, the more it's important to remember that DMX is an old enough protocol that it is one way. So the board doesn't know what it's connected to. And so addresses are a way to make sure that the signal coming out of the board hits what you want it to hit and controls what you want it to control. So the signal coming out of the back of the board looks like this. And this happens, Carl Spaulding's not on this call, is he? He likes to stand in the background sometimes and tell me when my facts are a little bit wrong. I think it sends it 44 times a second. It's something in that range. Not tremendously fast if we're talking about slow motion video or anything like that, but you know, fast enough for, for the human eye. Actually, let me go back one slide. Um, 
you'll notice if you look down at this, so address one at 50, address two at 25, address three at zero. Once we get to address 12 and up, all the way up to 512, it's 0%, and they're all, it still transmits that. So it's one through 512, what is it showing? Do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. Channels are at the console side and they are used to control addresses. And they are assigned through a process called patching, uh, which is the process of assigning one or multiple addresses to individual channels. You can put several addresses, so several devices on one channel. You cannot put one address on several channels. So reasons why you would patch, um, let's say you were, if patching can be, it's helpful to think about, uh, if you think about a console with sliders, that's a very easy way to sort of visualize the, the value of patching. So, you know, if I'm, in a studio and I'm running, I learned on a Lee color trend board. So I'm gonna say I'm running a Lee color trend board. Um, if I have the, a whole system of psych lights that I know I'm always going to control together, but they are patched, you know, they're plugged into different dimmers, through patching, I can put all of their addresses on one channel, on one slider, for lack of a better. And that's, so you're keeping like with like, uh, you're simplifying and organizing, right? So it's, it's all about, patching is a, is a process for you. Patching is a process to make your life as a dimmer board operator or the person that was standing closest to the dimmer board when they decided that they needed a dimmer board operator. It's a process to make your life easier. So here's an example. Um, if I patch address one to channel one, address two to channel one, and address three to channel two, and then I want, if I send this, if I say, all right, channel one and 100%, channel two at zero, what is gonna come out of the back of the fixture? Just if you, if you look at the way the patch is set up and then the channels, so address one is gonna come out at 100%, address two is gonna come out at 100% because they're both patched to channel one, and address three is gonna come out at zero because that's patched to channel two. All right, so I'm again. I'm before we're gonna get before we get into DMX with LEDs. I'm gonna talk quickly about uh, places where problems happen, because the more I talk, the more you'll find out that I'm not like the biggest fan of DMX as a protocol. There's a lot of little issues with it, um, and being a DMX technician is being a troubleshooting technician. That is, those are the same job description. Uh, so. Let's say you're in a situation and the wrong, you know, you bring something up and the wrong light turns on. That is an address issue by and large. Again, <clears throat> excuse me one second. DMX does not know, the board doesn't know what's, what it's connected to. If you take one thing away from this, just think the board doesn't know, the board doesn't know, the board doesn't know, the board doesn't know. So if I tell the board channel three at full and I have patched channel three, I thought I patched it to that light, but actually I patched it to that light. Or if I set the address on that patch from there, instead I put it over there. If my data is wrong, the board's still doing what you tell it to do. The board's just bringing channel three up to full, but the fact that it's that light that turns on instead of that light, I've lost track of where I was pointing, but you get the idea. If multiple address, if multiple devices turn on, you probably have an addressing overlap, which is to say that I called that light address four, and I also called that light address four. Nothing stopping me from doing that. Uh, I saw a sticker recently on the side of, I think it was a table saw, but it said, this machine has no brain, please use your own. Uh, and that's a, it's a valuable thing to keep in mind when you're setting systems up like this, you, you know, keep notes, keep track of stuff. If I bring up a channel and nothing turns on, could be an address issue. Again, if I thought I patched, if I thought I set that fixture to address three and I didn't, and I'm bringing up address three out of the back of the board, well, if there's no address three, nothing's going to turn on. Could also be a cable issue. So if you remember the, uh, 
the requirements. So there's impedance issues. There's, it's the wrong kind of cable. It's too much cable. And if the light is acting weird, which is a technical term that you'll hear a lot on set, uh, that's a product by and large, that's going to be a protocol issue. So it's a violation of the system. So you have too many devices in line. Your cable is too long. You put a Y split somewhere. I'm going to say here, disable RDM. If we get time at the end of the class, I will talk about RDM. By and large, that's not really an intro level idea. But if you're having problems, it's usually RDM. So find it, Google how to turn it off on your board and do it. All right, so DMX and LEDs. This is why most of you suddenly uh, care about, let me get scrim here or something. Uh, why it's DMX has become particularly relevant in the last few years for the film market is, it's really distracting how blown out I am. Go over here a little bit. Um, is because DMX and LEDs play very well together. So up until this point, when I've been saying device, you could have just substituted in the word dimmer, right? So we're talking about old school DMX controlling dimmers in a theater, controlling dimmers on a soundstage, device dimmer. So the ideas of it still work if the device becomes a, let's say, brand nameless LED RGB PAR. So there are some things to consider. Some things are different. Some things are the same. I am going to pause for a moment and see if anybody has any questions. Um, if you've got, because this is about to get a whole lot more complicated. So if you have questions about stuff that I've talked about already, let's get to those now. Um, so right now I'm seeing in the Q&A there are a couple of things. What is AKS? Uh, AKS is just short for accessories. Sorry. Um, actually, it's short for all kinds of stuff, but uh, I just use it. As, it's a shorthand for accessories, generally. Anybody else have any questions? Just put them in the Q&A down below. All right. Let's move on. If you have questions, oh, sometimes fixtures use an ethernet jack. Are there issues with converting the adapter type? That is a bigger question. Um, I'm gonna start, so Scott, I'm gonna keep your question open and then um, I will get back to it. Daniel, I don't know the specific impedance. Uh, again, this is the kind of thing where Carl Spalding stands in the back of the room. But uh, I will, uh, there's going to be a follow-up email to this class and I will send you the actual standard. Uh, and that document includes all of the specific, like, you know, you need a five ohm resistor here kind of thing. So I will send that after this class. And Scott, I will get to your question. All right, so DMX and LEDs, what is different? What is the same? Different. So the thing about LEDs that is valuable to keep in mind is that as opposed to, let's think about a, a, a baby 1K, an old school tungsten fixture. In order to dim that light, you either put a scrim in front of it or you hook it up to you know, a, a strand pack and dim it through that. There's no way, no, shaking or prodding of that light is going to dim the bulb inside it. LEDs, you can do that. They are direct dimming fixtures. They, the onboard capabilities of the fixture includes reducing intensity. Also, you never, 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 unless, so I say always when I teach the class, I say you never hook up LEDs to dimmers and then someone brings up an example of an LED that's made to be hooked up to a dimmer. It is true. Some LEDs are designed to be what is called phase dimmed or hooked up to a dimmer. By and large, especially the expensive ones, sky panel is the standby. If you take your airy sky panel and plug it into a dimmer, you're not gonna have a good time. Um, you think about, it's a computer, right? It's a computer that spits out light out of the front of it. So the same thing will happen to your sky panel that will happen to 
your computer if you suddenly dim the power, if you drop the power going into it. It might be fine, it might not. You might suddenly start seeing weird behavior. With a cheat, you know, if I'm thinking about this generic RGB par here that definitely doesn't have the engineering to stop bad things from happening when dimmed power comes in. Uh, if you dim it, the lights are gonna flicker for I'm gonna say five minutes straight and then you have a very, a very expensive paperweight. So no dimmers on DMX, on a LED. And the other thing that is different about LEDs is they have multiple attributes. So a dimmer, single attribute, intensity, the dimmer dims, right? And there's a single address. An RGB par specifically has three attributes, red, green, blue intensities. And so the fixture needs three addresses, red, green, blue. The things that are the same, you are still manually addressing these lights. If you go up to the back of an RGB par, you will see there are little dip switches and you say this is going to be address 210 or two or 504. So addressing for multiple attribute, addressing for multiple address fixtures becomes a little bit more mental gymnastics. So if I have five dimmers, going back to dimmers for a second, and they're one address each, dimmer one is gonna be address one, dimmer two is address two, three, three, four, four, five, five, right? That's pretty easy. Not saying that you can't still make mistakes, not saying that I still haven't made mistakes doing this, but it's a little bit simpler to wrap your head around. One thing in my hand, that's one address. If I have 10 of them, that's 10 addresses. If I have five RGB LED fixtures with three addresses each, I'm going to set what is called the starting address, right? So the fixture, hold up one second, the cat's trying to climb up the back of the computer. I have five RGB LED fixtures with three addresses each. I'm setting what is called the start address. So my first LED is gonna start with address one. My second is gonna start at address four because fixture one has three addresses on board, RGB. So the first one I have set address one. So that's gonna be red is one, green is blue. <laughs> red is one, green is two, blue is three. That's like one of those mugs. And then my next fixture begins at address four seven, 10, 13. I literally had to make this PowerPoint slide tell me those starting addresses because I cannot be counted on, especially at eight o'clock in the morning on Saturday, but at all to be able to do that math in my head quickly and not get the numbers wrong. So these numbers are right, I hope. All right, so here's an example, address one, is red control, address two is blue control, address three is green control. So it's that same RGB par that we're thinking about. And let's say I have five fixtures that are addressed sequentially. So again, because I'm when I address, I manually set all of these parameters, right? So I could say fixture one, your address one, fixture two, your address 10. And I do that a lot, especially if I, if I don't know something about the light, if I just want to give it room. But then it could only have addresses one, two, three in it, and then addresses four through nine are open and not useful. So when I say something is addressed sequentially, I mean there, is, there are no gaps between the fixtures. So if something is a three parameter fixture and it starts at one, address one, so one, two, three, the next one's going to start at four. And then again, I really can't do it in my head, but you get it, three, 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 no gaps. So if this is the command, this is the look that I want, right? So lights one through three, I want to set green at full. Light four, I wanna set blue at full. 
And light five, I want white. Um, anybody know how you get, oh, well, again, uh, white light from an RGB par is just red at full, green at full, blue at full. It is a, a, an unflattering shade of pink, much more than it is anything resembling white, but uh, that is what they call it. So I'm going to let you take a moment on your own to see if you can figure out what the signal coming out of the back of the board looks like. So, you know, what is what addresses are at what values, and I'm not doing any 50%. This is either all on or all off. So if you, again, RGB fixtures, five of them, starting with one, lights one through three, green is at full, light four, blue is at full, light five, red, green, and blue are all at full. I'm gonna give you a moment to kind of think about this, and then I will put up an answer. All right. So this is what we're looking at. So address one, two, or zero. Address three is at 100, right? Red, green. Yes, red, blue, green. I actually, I, I put that in and tricked myself. Uh, so address three, which is green on the first three fixtures is at full. Address two on the fourth fixture is at full. And the last three address one, two, three, or 13, 14, 15 on the final fixture is at full. So where some people might've gotten tripped up is that this fixture is an RBG instead of an RGB. That's the kind of, um, the manufacturers don't necessarily make sense. <laughs> um, and, and sometimes, you know, RGB is the standby. RGB is, is the term that a lot of us use, but it's important to double check that the fixture actually uses them in that order. Um, or it uses, if it, you know, uses RGB at all as you get into more complicated fixtures, and we'll talk about this a little bit, um, the diodes can be in kind of any order. It could be a green, red, blue fixture. So if you go in saying, oh, this is a little, you know, my, my standby is like an Amazon, something, a DJ light you can buy on Amazon. That's really gonna have some, you know, vetting, I'm sure. And it's gonna be rigidly adhering to the standard. Um, but you know, if this Amazon DJ light Sure, it's RGB, but they might not be addressed in that particular, you know, internally, the order might be off. So that's when the manual comes in. Always have the manual. If there is a fixture that you are responsible for controlling, get the manual. Going back to places where problems happen, this is all the same stuff, except now you have, your light is the wrong color because earlier your light was just on or it was off. Now you could have addressed it wrong. So, right, think about that. If I have an RGB fixture that I think, and we're gonna say it's RGB, if I think it's on address one, but actually it's on address two, and I call up full green, which is two, as far as I'm concerned, two at full, this fixture, sees two at full and gets, all right, I am starting at two, so red is two, red goes to full. The board didn't do anything wrong. The fixture didn't do anything wrong. You did something wrong. <laughs> uh, so addressing, addressing, addressing. So if you're, again, this is used in the field, if you are responsible for the control of an LED fixture, get, get the manual, get the manual. You will, in, in most 
manufacturer's manuals, you will get a chart of the DMX address count with a full report of what they do. And these can vary kind of anywhere from, uh, this is a slightly older PowerPoint, so this fixture actually doesn't even really exist anymore. Uh, but the Quantum 120 was a two address fixture. It was intensity and color temperature. The other end uh, is the Airy Sky Panel S60C, model 31, mode 31, which has 42 addresses. Um, there is now a much more vigorous example of this, um, which is the 360, which I, I, I think the most it can have is, it's more than 200, I think, in its most unpacked form. Uh, can have more than 200 addresses. So you can start running into problems uh, quickly if you're having address issues or, you know. And unfortunately, they're, you know, n everybody's not controlling these on, on manual boards with sliders. Consoles are much more evolved and much more capable of processing fixtures with this firepower. But but the reason I frame the class in this way is that it's it's important to remember that everything is still built on a protocol that was made for dimmers everything is still built around something that never could have imagined the sky panel 360 or any of the other things that are now DMX devices. So there are some weirdnesses with it and it's important to remember the limitations of the protocol. So um, I, I mean, that's pretty much right on the money, 831. So that's basically half the class just sort of going through stuff. Um, got some vocabulary on the screen right now. And then I, I would love to take some questions, just sort of see where folks have, uh, want to get into more detail. There are a couple of questions right now I can already see. Um, so if you've got stuff that you want to talk about, put it in the Q and A here. I don't know where I am on your screen. All right. So Scott, sometimes fixtures use an ethernet. Jack, are there issues when converting the adapter type? So no, when it's on the fixture end. If a light, um, the, the ETC source forward is a great example because it is designed, that they made that light to be as small as they could and literally five pin DMX ports were too big. So they had to put ethernet jacks on it just to make it smaller. Um, I am also a big fan of, of Ethernet because everybody already has it. So, you know, if you're in a situation where you need to do a run, you know, you know the Ethernet can carry DMX. There's no issue with that. Where you run into issues, so you can, you know, you can put a converter on to get into the fixture with five pin, whatever it is. Where you can run into issue, Scott, and where I wanted to, to give your question a little bit more room is if there is a Ethernet jack coming out of a console, or if there is an Ethernet jack on a fixture that also has a five pin DMX jack. And people later today are going to talk about this in much more detail. Um, there are streaming protocols, SACN, ArtNet, that are also lighting control protocols that talk to DMX but are not DMX. So if you have what you assume is a fixture that takes DMX over ethernet and you convert your DMX signal to ethernet and plug it in, but it's looking for one of these streaming protocols, you will not be able to control the light. You have to use a device called a gateway or a node to, and again, this is much above an intro level, but you have to convert that protocol with a dedicated box. So to your question, if the fixture is looking for DMX, and that's again, something you can figure out in the manual, then you're golden. You can flip back and forth all day long. But if it's looking for one of these streaming protocols, pause. All right. Uh, any other questions? Can you demystify what an opto splitter does or how it works? Yes, I love demystifying things. 
especially optus blurs because they're weird. So an optus splitter is, is a way, so I said at the beginning that you cannot have Y splits on DMX, right? Clearly for laying out a network system of fixtures, you will not be able to get them all in a line if you get to any kind of quantity. Even if you think about a theater, you know, where you've got pipes, battens of fixtures. And if I was running data to each of them, if I'm in one of the few theaters in the country that's all LED and so all of the data goes straight to the lights, you're not, you can't just daisy chain through. So what an optic splitter does, it's an optical splitter. And what that does, is that allows me to put one DMX in and have several come out. And it does it with lasers and, and it's not, I don't know why it has to be that. Um, I do a little bit, but it, it's a, it, if you think about it in a networking sense, it's a repeater splitter. So it takes the signal in and it recreates it, uh, let's say it's a four port opti. So it's one in, four outs. It's gonna take the signal in and recreate it four times. And it does it, it optically, hence opti. It creates that signal optically over an air gap using a laser. So that, and the reason that that is important uh, is that it isolates each of those outputs if it's well made. So let's talk a again about uh, where things go bad. So if I have, um, this happens a lot, especially in like indie projects where you go into a location and they, you know, it's a nightclub location and they've got a bunch of these, right? Amazon RGB pars. And you're like, I'd love to control these. I think this would add some really nice flare and kick, you know? flash and trash to the system. Opti splitters are really good for a situation like that because they, if you put all of those flash and trash LEDs that you know nothing about on one branch of your Opti, then if they have protocol issues, like let's say, you know, there's reflection down the line or any number of things that are bad with LED, where something is corrupting the whole system. If there's no optical splitter, if something comes back down the line, it's going to affect every light in your system and you're gonna see flashes and you're gonna see kinds of bad stuff. If you isolate them on the Opti, then they can freak out, but the rest of your lights won't. And that's, you know, it's good for isolating stuff like that, especially as you start to build larger and larger systems, whole set builds, an opti is really good for, and it also is just an effective way to, to say, I need a DMX drop over there and over there. So I don't have to daisy, you know, I don't need a 250 foot DMX run to connect these two banks of fixtures. If that doesn't answer your question, um, let me know. All right. If it's possible to control DMX over ethernet, does it mean that DMX can be controlled over Wi-Fi? Yes, but not the way that you're thinking. Um, so this is why I make the distinction of streaming ACN or um, DMX over ethernet. Both of them are lighting control protocol Lighting control protocols. They both go through an ethernet cable. Only SACN and ARTNET are network in the like computer science sense of the word protocols. So ARTNET can go over Wi-Fi. So if I have a, an ARTNET transmitter and I actually, um, Luminaire, Luminaire is a good example of this. So Luminaire can, one of, it's a, for those of you who don't know, Luminaire is a lighting control app. Um, apparently this means app, but you, you know, you put it on your iPad and then you can control things. Um, the, the Rat Pack Centena 
system and the AKS are built around this idea. The, the AKS has a Wi-Fi transmitter and a ARTnet antenna. And that's what makes it powerful is that it, it can create a Wi-Fi signal for your iPad and then also an ARTnet signal. Um, but because ARTnet is a network protocol, and I have done this, you can take like um, TP-Link makes a really nice wireless access point that's about this big. And if I put that wireless access point on the back of the light that's looking for an ARTnet signal, and I just plug it in to the light with a piece of ethernet, and then I send an ARTnet signal over Wi-Fi from my iPad, the light can receive it. That is not DMX. <laughs> That is a whole different thing, but it can work. Um, thanks for the clarification. Can you use runs of Ethernet, Cat5, or a specific type to carry the DMX signal? Yes. Um, and I will send the protocol, which has some more information about this to everybody who's in the class right now. Sorry, just checking on time. Um, and there are some distinctions. Um, what you, the, the cable run length changes when you're running over Cat5, um, but you absolutely can. You can run a DMX signal over Cat5. I really like doing that when I am putting something in that's going to be there forever or for a longer time, you know, in an architectural environment, a theatrical environment like Backbone. Um, I mean, the problem with Ethernet is the RJ45 connector, right? So uh, if you're talking about durable onset product, you've got a five pin DMX connector, which is just, it's metal. And like, sure, you can break it if you run a forklift over it. But all I have to do to break an RJ45 connector is look at it wrong. So you have, you know, it's a much cheaper cable and a much easier cable to get, but it's nowhere near as durable. Um, issue of master slave programming is always important in chains of many lights. Uh, Femi, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. Um, there is, uh, there is, so I'll talk about the idea of it quickly. Um, there is a concept in, uh, DMX called master slave or uh, lead follow, which is I have a fixture that is going to be my origin and then fixtures that are attached to it that will duplicate it. So you don't use that much when you're actually programming um, because if you have the ability to, you know, let's say you have the room, the overhead to reach all of the fixtures in a room, then you don't really need to do this. Where that comes in handy is if I'm uh, if I'm a fixtures technician and I'm operating, let's say it's an effect on a light and I want all 10 of these lights to do the exact same thing. You don't need to set up a console for that. If the light can generate the effect on its own, you can set up lead follow and then all of the lights will do that thing. Um, it's very useful as a time saving tool not necessarily as useful in programming because there are ways around it. And if a, a system of lights are set in master slave or lead follow, then they're set that way. And you can't on your end, you know, change them without going out and adjusting them. But if you are controlling them individually and just choose to group them together on your console, then later on in the day, you can ungroup them. All right, Kevin asks, why do I sometimes need a DMX terminator? Kevin, you always need a DMX terminator. You, you always should have at least four on your person. Even if you're not on set, just carry DMX terminators around. They cost like a dollar. They don't, I sell them, they cost like five bucks, but still. Um, so DMX terminators are, are bizarre. And it's another, it's a weirdness of the protocol. Technically, what you should do to be protocol compliant, if you have a run of fixtures or a run of dimmers or whatever, a run of devices, you should 
terminate the last fixture in line. Some fixtures have um, like old Kino lights used to have switches on them that were terminate or not. And that would shut off the uh, DMX out port or turn it back on. Plenty of people go through life without terminating systems. It's literally a DMX terminator. It's just a male DMX plug with a resistor soldered in line that you pop on the output. Technically what that does is it stops something called reflection. So you send your DMX signal down the line and when the DMX signal encounters an open output, it can come back up the line. And this will happen in different ways. It will appear in different ways, but pretty reliably when it comes back down the line, if it's three o'clock in the morning and you have a hard out and this is absolutely the last time you can do this shot, that's when you're gonna start having reflection issues. That's just my experience. It will cause, again, lights to act weird. It's a protocol violation effectively. So lights can flick, flickering is usually what you get. Suddenly all your lights start flickering um, because they see a signal coming back up the DMX line and they interpret that because DMX is a one-way protocol. They interpret that reflection as a command. And so they just change. Um, so if you pop a terminator on the end, it replicates an infinite DMX system and it gets rid of reflection. All right. Uh, do you use EtherCon connector when using RJ45 to avoid damaging the RJ45 connectors? Absolutely. I love EtherCon. Um, those of you who don't know, EtherCon is uh, effectively show ready ethernet or it's, it actually was designed I think for touring because um, places like Cirque du Soleil or you know, like big live productions that have to use network protocols because of the number of lights they have and the number of moving lights they have. Um, EtherCon is just an RJ45 plug inside of one of those metal um, DMX collars. And it's great, it's absolutely great. A little bit more expensive than RJ45, but if you're in a situation where you have to build out a uh, system, then yeah, you should absolutely use EtherCon. The downfall of EtherCon, Brad, is that um, you have to make sure that every device that you're planning to use is EtherCon enabled. And that is like, that is a stupid hardware thing. That's not even like some fancy protocol. That's just, if I have a, let's say it all feeds back to a PoE switch. If that switch doesn't have circles around the ethernet ports to accept that collar, you just won't be able to plug it in. Um, there are switches that are ethercon enabled. Pathway makes a great one um, where you can, you know, so every component of the system can be ethercon, but uh, you just, it's something you have to think about. So if you show up to set with a bunch of ethercon cable, you might have to make some runs or cut stuff or, you know, do something a little silly, but by and large, I love EtherCon. All right. Terminators are needed in order to keep the impedance correct. Yeah, pretty much. All right. Any other questions? We've got like 10 minutes left. Um, I can talk about RDM very quickly, because that is, a, is another vocabulary word that is becoming a lot more relevant very quickly to a lot of people. And it's something that probably would be useful to know um, if you're going on to a, to a production environment. Just understand that there's a lot of nuance to RDM, because it doesn't work well yet. And it might never work well because uh, there are already people who are trying to replace RDM as a protocol. RDM stands for remote device management. What that means, so 
again, DMX, if you think about the DMX signal that we talked about beginning of the class, sends out one at full, two at full, da, 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 five, 12 at full, pause, one at full, two at full, ba, 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 ba. There's a pause in there. And that pause is what lets the fixtures know that the next, what is called packet, the next grouping of DMX information is coming. So what RDM does is it uses that pause to transmit information backwards. So you need an RDM compliant console, an RDM compliant, RDM enabled console, an RDM enabled fixture. Um, but sig the board sends out a packet of information. There's that pause. In that pause, the fixture sends back information about itself. You can use RDM for a whole mess of things and it can be really, really, really great because what I can do with RDM, uh, I can remotely address fixtures. So rather than clicking on the back, this light is address one, this next light, one, two, three, is address four, and doing that, you know, hanging on a harness backwards off a pipe, you could just hang all your lights, enable RDM, and then address everything. Sorry. Um, the, and, you know, so there's, and RDM can be used theoretically to tell the board information about lamp hours and battery status and all of this stuff that's really good to know. The problem with RDM uh, is, is that it's not what I would call a backwards compatible idea, right? RDM doesn't work if, so let's say I have a run of fixtures and there's, 10 tungsten lights on dimmers, and then 10 brand spanking new sexy LEDs that are RDM enabled. When those fixtures send an RDM signal back, they won't have any issue because they are RDM enabled. When that signal goes back through the dimmers, you will probably see it because the dimmers will interpret it as a command because they don't know about RDM in the simplest way to put it. Like, DMA, they're just looking for a signal on that line. And so when a signal comes back, direction doesn't really matter to the fix, to the dimmer. And so it'll flicker or it will buzz or it will do something. And so if you're using RDM, you just have to be very, very, very careful with your system layout and when it's enabled and how you're using it. Um, literally every story I've ever heard about big onset, DMX catastrophes that were not, you know, this manufacturer's light wasn't ready yet, are RDM. You know, this box was transmitting RDM and there's, we didn't know that. And so it wasn't communicating correctly. Or, you know, this, um, something that you see a lot. So older light ribbon, uh, light gear LED tape is not RDM enabled, just not. So when a signal goes backwards through it, if you've got a system of fixtures and there's LED tape in line, the tape is gonna flicker. And for those of you who have done tape install, you know, usually it's everywhere. <laughs> so all of a sudden your whole set is flashing and you don't know what's going on. So um, going back to the earlier question about opti splitters, opti splitters, if they are RDM opti splitters, are a great tool for this. Because again, you can isolate your RDM fixtures on one branch of that Opti. Hello. Or if you can hear the cat screaming in the background. Um, you can isolate your RDM fixtures on one branch of that Opti. And then when the signal comes back down the line, it doesn't affect all your other RDM or your, your RDM not enabled devices. It's great, but you really just have to plan for it. Yeah. All right. Um, Five minutes. I'm gonna I'm gonna hang up for a little bit. If anybody has any more questions, feel free to put them in the Q and A. I will stop sharing. Um, but yeah, thank everybody so much. Um, we have so many more classes. We have exhibitors. There's a lot of stuff going on today. So um, check filmscapechicago.com has all of the classes, all of the exhibitors. Um, 
this does not work like a classroom. So you can't just sit in here and be put into the next class. You need to leave and come back for a different uh, class, but awesome. Thanks everybody so much. I'm gonna take some questions as they come up and yeah, have a great rest of your day. Val raised her hand. So Val, I think I can, give me one second. I have to find you if you're still here. Um, I can allow you to talk, so I'm going to click allow to talk, and then you can ask your question. Go. I think you're muted. All right, Val, I'm going to come back to your question. Um, just keep your hand up if you're still interested and then I'll circle back. Just unmute your microphone. Uh, can you share your PowerPoint slide? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll send that along. I'll send, I'll send the presentation along with the, uh, with the email that I sent with the protocol after the class. Hi, Gary. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Scott. Glad you came. Okay, Val, if you're there, I still can't hear you. Your hand is still up. All right, I'm gonna, if you wanna just type your question in the, in the Q&A. All right. Thank you, Daniel. All right, nobody has any other questions. I will go ahead and end this call. Thank you all so much. This is a, a fun way to start the day. Oh, <laughs> thanks Scott. All right, see you everybody.